We are pleased now to welcome back to Dayton, Adam Johnson, the author of The Orphan Master's Son, winner of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize 2013 Award in Fiction, and the 2013 Pulitzer Prize. Johnson is the author of Emporium, a short story collection, and the novel Parasites Like Us, which won a California Book Award in 2003. Recognition for his work includes a Whiting Writers Award and a Swarthout Writing Award and the 2010 Gina Baralt Literary Award. He has received fellowships from Guggenheim, the National Endowment for the Arts, a Stegner Fellowship, and a Kingsbury Fellowship. Adam teaches creative writing at Stanford University. His fiction has appeared in Esquire, the Paris Review, Harper's, Tin House, Granta, and Playboy, as well as the Best American Short Stories. Adam joins us from San Francisco to introduce the 2014 fiction winner. told to adjust the mic. <laughs> I could go on at great length with my gratitude to be here, um, but I'll be brief. I'll just say it's a particular, particular joy to be able to introduce Bob Shikoshis and to return here to Dayton uh, this year after last year is a crowning joy. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there are many ways to get hurt in this world. And while Seamus Heaney famously said, no poem or play or song can fully right a wrong, inflicted or endured, Bob Shikosius' novel, The Woman Who Lost Her Soul, takes the most important step in toward righting a wrong, and that is by bearing witness and giving testimony. And what we bear witness to here is war. In this novel, war is alive. It has its own life and is as much a character as the humans it shares its pages with. From moments of dark conception, we see birth the terrible infant of war. Conflicts grow and mature, making permanent marks upon landscapes and generations, and long after they seem to be banished by humanity's second and better thoughts, we see war has been busy breeding little new wars of their own. Yet, this novel shows us there are other ways of being traumatized than through direct conflict. If you've ever met the child of a Holocaust survivor, you know trauma can be inherited. Witnessing trauma is a sure way to receive it, as is telling and hearing the stories of suffering. Such stories are told outside of a time and space recognizable to the rest of us. They assume shapes and genres that elude familiarity. Hence, this novel must travel to Haiti, to Turkey, to Croatia. We must visit the 40s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. We see that the fabric of the normal novel must be ripped to capture this story. And torn too are identities, motives, desires, and allegiances. Hence, the sweep, the scope, the epic and operatic nature of this book. Are you a good guy or a bad guy? That is a question this novel asks over and over. And isn't that a question of our time? Isn't that what we ask of our politicians, our corporations, our in institutions, and increasingly of people we simply don't know well enough to call friends? War and suffering and uncertainty are ancient states of being. So the woman who lost her soul is not outside of a tradition. In the lineage of Joseph Conrad, Graham Greene, and Robert Stone, Bob Shikoshis has captured all that is best in the 19th century novel. Its sweeping ambition, its adventurous spirit, its duty to investigate a story on all levels of society, and its willingness to travel across time, landscape, and perspective to do so. Imbued with 
this is all that's great in the 20th century novel, an acknowledgement of complexity, contradiction, context, and the centrality of psychology. Infusing these traditions, Shikoshis has pointed the way for the novelists of the 21st century. And to return to Seamus Heaney, in that same poem, he also reminds us that the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up to make hope and history rhyme. And what that tidal wave is, what it's made of, why we remember Heaney's words and why we'll remember Shikoshis' words is art. A novel is a work of art. And no matter how dark or troubling a novel is, its power comes from its beauty. Beauty is the wave of the woman who lost her soul. So let me conclude by sharing one of this novel's countless moments of beauty. It's a single sentence from the first half of the book. On the flight across the Bay of Ganav, the Chinook speared through the top of a squall, bumping in and out of the storm's cluster of cells, purple whirlwinds of rain opening into brilliant white celestial amphitheaters of billowing cumulus, then slamming back into the tempest, the rain shearing off into calm blue fields, scrubbed with sunlight, then shearing back into a dark whip of chaos. And when it was all over, Tom felt spiritually alive and filled with gratitude. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of this year's Dayton Literary Peace Prize in Fiction, Bob Shikoshis. each other forever. He's been a student in my writing program down there in Tallahassee. Um, sorry, uh, to me that was like critical heroin. And um, you know, how many times do you think you're going to get that in your life as a writer? It's, I'm such a brilliant writer himself. My God, I've been um, so happy to be drag around on your coattails, student. <laughs> the poets are Dayton. Um, is it okay if I just stand up here and say thank you, thank you, thank you for the next 10 minutes because that's what I'd really like to do. But thanks to Adam and the first readers and the judges, my God, and the founders, Sharon and Mark and the donors, and Dayton herself, yourself. Um, you didn't know when you were awarded me and the rest of us the honor and privilege of this prize that you were saluting our literary family and offering us the opportunity to expand it. You know, I flew here with Margaret Rinkel, my sister from New Mexico, she's been trying to get me to break my leg so I wouldn't come tonight so she'd get the first place to cry. <laughs> <laughs> right, Margaret. <laughs> and um, last week I was in Hong Kong with Chang Rei Li, who I was meeting for the first time, and he said, the Dayton Literary Prize, you're gonna love it. I loved it when they gave it to me, man, it's so great. And there's Adam and, and um, you know, I was at his wedding at Robin, my colleague Robert Olin Butler's house there, down there in Tallahassee, and, and Bob Butler has been up here too. And, you know, Faith Adiele, and I've known each other for many years. He's one of the coolest people I've ever known in my life. And there's Ben Fountain and Tim O'Brien and Mark Karlansky and Edwidge Danticott, who I've known since she was a very young woman, and She's in my novel, Edwidge is. Not by name, but she's in a scene where a movie director is trying to get my mm, uh, first uh, main protagonist to uh, take him up into the mountains to meet a guerrilla leader. And Edwidge was a part of the entourage of that movie director, Jonathan Demme, sitting at that table. 
and um, you know, there's all all these people and so many other Dayton alumni, and now Karima and Joe and Gilbert and Marlon, and I, I'm so proud that we're here in Dayton taking this journey together, and that our work is bound together by the sensibilities we share. How did you know, Dayton, that we were out there <laughs> in our extended family? How did you know that? How did you find us? Really, it's a wonder. New York can't seem to do that. <laughs> It's a wonder, and it seems a type of miracle in the literary village in Diaspora. And you, Sharon Rabb, have provided us with hard and indisputable evidence that one person can become, through her vision and tenacity and passion, many persons, and make a difference in the world. Listen to this, Sharon. Here in Dayton tonight, we are all Sharon Rav. <laughs> and by any measure, under any God, the Dayton literary community and its award series are a blessing upon this land. And I'm not bullshitting anybody. <laughs> I really am not. Um, Oh, one more thing before I switch gears here. Louise, <laughs> two Lifetime Achievement Awards in one season. <laughs> Time for the rocking chair, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and a jug of wine. <laughs> How wonderful it is when a writer you admire and respect so much as a person and cherish on the page, gets the recognition she deserves. So, we've known each other since we were sort of babies, right? Yeah. Okay. No, you weren't. Get out of here. I remember you sitting in my lap, but you weren't my student. <laughs> it's hard to get a laugh at a peace conference there. <laughs> Just my... <laughs> uh, I'm going to get serious. There are so many ways to answer the question, what's the value of literature? In the mid-1990s, for the first time since the Cuban Revolution, American publishers were allowed to have a book fair in Havana. And I was lucky enough to be a member of the American delegation of writers in attendance. And I was especially fortunate to meet and talk with Ricardo Alarcón, the president of the National Assembly, the third most powerful man in Cuba be behind the Castro brothers, Fidel and Raul. And during our discussion, and with the state television cameras rolling, I asked President Alarcón if he thought a book can be a weapon. No, he answered disingenuously, unless you take the book and cut out a hole in the middle of the pages and you hide a gun in there or plant a bomb, then the book can be a weapon. I said, oh, really? Then why have you imprisoned writers in Cuba? They're not writers, he said. You don't go into jail in Cuba for being a writer. You go to jail for being a dissident who works against the state. Well, no surprise that politicians and heads of state know the answer to the question, what is the value or the power of literature? They know. In particular, the bad guys always know the answer, while the good guys, like, say, a newspaper editor, <laughs> seem to shrug off the question as irrelevant to the paper's mission and drop the book pages and forget about it. And why are we losing readers, says the publisher. 
I heard a writer friend of mine, a Vietnamese American, once say, when was the last time an American president found it worth his while to write a speech on the importance of art and literature? I can't recall. But it's no surprise that in a coup d'etat or a military junta or the rise of a dic dictatorship or a totalitarian system, the writers, the poets and playwrights and novelists and journalists are the first to go. Go to exile or go to jail or go to the grave. Every politician on earth wishes the people who don't agree with him or her would shut up and go away. Even in democracies, speaking truth to power is not a welcome act. The ruling class in a democracy will practice the virtue of tolerance, which means most often, but not always, that you, the writer, will simply be ignored. Ignoring is a passive form of silencing. And silencing is what happens to writers in political systems that do not look kindly upon the freedom of speech. But why does literature have this power to get under the skin of people in power? Because books are subversive. Why are books subversive? Because they exchange ignorance for knowledge and empathy. And although ignorance is the social currency tyrants use to buy the compliance of the masses, empathy is the breeding ground for justice, for mercy, for fairness, for templates of redemption, and for allowing the validity of a point of view other than your own, which is one of the most revolutionary things anybody can do. Oh, I disagree with you, but I really understand. Your point of view is valid. And I don't think I need to kill you today because <laughs> we don't agree. The relentless intimacy of literature underscores the truth. And you know what it is. We are not so different, you and I. And what differences we have are not insurmountable. And art, a wise man once said, is the liberation of the humanity inside yourself. Every great book eventually arrives at a single destination, our common humanity. Everybody who's come up here to speak tonight has said this phrase, our common humanity, which sometimes and tragically is only visible through our inhumanity. Ellie Wiesel has said, in the face of suffering, one has no right to turn away, not to see. And of course, once you see, you can no longer say that you didn't know. And you have landed yourself in a moral quandary. Generation after generation, there's no more reliable guarantor of this maxim than literature which will never allow you to turn away. The afterlife of a war is a book. Long after the combatants are dead and poppies have grown on the battlefield, every true book about war cries out, stop. After millennia of warfare, literature was able, finally, and it took forever, but this is what it had to do, to separate war from glory. Red Badge of Courage in our Civil War is one of the first books that comes to mind for our culture. When the ruling class could no longer provide society with a conscience like it's in danger of doing today, literature did. We cannot understand or grasp our genius or our madness except through narrative, however we form or display our stories on the page or screen or song sheet or stage. We will never know each other except through our stories. Literature not only suggests our complicity and culpability in what for Americans has been 
a tradition. You have to face this, it's true. A tradition of ferocious violence. We have not ever produced a generation in America who we have not sent to war. Literature not only suggests our complicity and culpability in that, it also, along with its sister arts, the only venue where accountability, it's also, literature is also the only venue where accountability sticks, where you can't turn away from your mistakes. Generation after generation, ask Julius Caesar if you can hide from literature. Ask Alexander Solzhenitsyn, whose books outlasted the empire that tried to kill him. Sooner or later, of course, we have to ask ourselves, why is peace so elusive? We Americans are more likely to take up a gun than pick up a book. Mark Twain suggested a solution to the problem. Take all the oxygen out of the atmosphere for eight minutes. <laughs> then we shall have universal peace and it will be permanent. Uh, a, a, two or three weeks ago, I was reading the New York Times and my eye uh, co was caught by an article about what's going on in Lithuania. I'm 100% Lithuanian. And um, the reporter was interviewing a Lithuanian farmer, a woman, Cassia Junkin, who was speaking of the revival of Russian aggression, and of course the Baltic states are worried about this after they've seen what's happening in the Ukraine. And Cassia Junkin said this, and it's important. <laughs> if we have a nervous and unpredictable neighbor, we avoid him. But when he starts breaking your windows, you have to do something. Okay, you have to do something. But what do you want to do? When you stop believing that justice is available or that the process of justice, however slow it might be, is the most reasonable and sane course of action to answer an injustice, when you stop believing that, then you are at war. When you look beyond justice for something else to address your grievance, then you are at war. When justice even, isn't even a part of the equation for belligerence, then you are at war for the basest of reasons, and your war can never be justified by the territory you seize, or the wealth you steal, or the lives you ruin. If in some wars we can say there's a moral high ground, in most wars throughout history there is not. We know this long, am I going too long? <laughs> in most wars in history, there is no moral high ground. We know this long afterward from reading books, from reading literature. We know from our reading that over and over again, a man like Stalin, and history is full of Stalins, learned that Violence was the key to success. Over and over again, why have we as a nation not learned that this is not true for us? That at least since World War II, violence, the violence we have initiated or participated in has never turned out well. Not for us and not for our so-called enemies. This is one to say. Do you know how many people we killed in Vietnam? Vietnamese people? 3.5 million. Why? What did that do? Except destroy 3.5 million lives and actually plenty of others. Why isn't it clear to us today that the status quo will unmake us? The status quo, the way things are right now, will unmake the world. Can the books reverse the process? And incrementally, I think, 
fool that I am that, yeah, they can, given enough time. Do we have enough time? Oh, I don't know. Given enough, given enough time, they can slowly teach us to say stop. They can slowly help us to rebuild our souls. But to paraphrase Ed Abbey, the idea of peace needs no defense. It only needs more defenders. Ultimately, this is the message of all books worthy to the claims of literature. There is never a time on earth when moral complacency is acceptable. Never. E.L. Dr. Rao said this, the reason we need writers is because we need witnesses. But this duty presents us with a question, not an answer. What is it exactly that the writer is obligated to witness? Shouldn't all writers ask themselves which stories are most worth telling? Shouldn't all readers ask themselves which stories are most worth reading? These questions about what's worth writing never seems to have, they never seem to have good answers or easy answers or perfect answers, especially at the cultural moment in the journey of our nation where the common response seems to be more often than not, who cares? Yet sooner or later, history will drag us out of our bubbles and self-absorption and reassert itself into our lives and thus reassert itself into our creative vision and into the aesthetics of our imagination as it must and will. And that rendering also gestures toward the last line of one of the great novels written in my lifetime, which is a book called Continental Drift by Russell Banks. And surely, this is the last line that must somehow find its way into your heart as a writer. Not a responsibility or a command, but an article of Whitman-esque faith in the word. And here's the last line, and it's a good one. Go, my book, and destroy the world as it is. <laughs>